We are ready for a quick fire roundup of everything that happened at the workshops so that you will realize what you missed because you chose one workshop over another. But we have a quick, we have a fairly tight time schedule. So I'm going to hand over to Ursula who will talk about the first workshop. Thank you, Jane. And hi, everyone. Oh, sorry, this is loud. So I'm going to try first if this works. It does. Um, so hi, I'm Ursula. I work for the Open Access Book Usage Data Trust effort. And I'm going to give you a very quick update on what we discussed in our workshop um, and how it all went. So first of all, to give you a little bit of background, the Open Access Book Usage Data Trust effort is developing a digital infrastructure for a trusted community governed exchange of open access book usage data among private and public organizations. So the way this is done within the effort is by adopting the International Data Space Association model for data spaces. If you haven't heard of this, it's a neutral data intermediary, to put it in uh, short, to facilitate the data exchange with a zero copy, po copy policy. What this means is that it doesn't create a copy of the data, it doesn't hold the data, it doesn't create a repository, it's not a data archive or anything like that. It facilitates the exchange between the different parties involved that want to exchange the data. So with this particular workshop uh, and with the community's help, we are currently exploring the strengths and weaknesses of various cost recovery oriented revenue generation options for nonprofit open scholarly infrastructure and understanding how sustainability models might impact trust, neutrality, and global participation to explore mitigation strategies that address concerns. The method is very simple. We are doing this in person workshops like we did today and uh, yesterday, and we also are doing online focus groups as well. And this is all done uh, across uh, end of last year and beginning of this year. So just to a heads up, and I hope all the participants from our workshop know, this is a very, very high level summary of what we discussed, not just here, but also on another workshop that we already did to give you an idea. So we are basically discussing the different uh, models from onboarding fees to membership fees, grants, lifecycle fees, sponsorships, or demand-based API fees, but not just these ones. And we are considering what are the strengths what are the weaknesses? What are the unique attributes of each so that we can get the input from the community in our, for our sustainability model moving forward? So what are the next steps? And I just want to first thank you all the participants who have chosen to be part of that workshop. Um, there are more workshops to come if you are interested as well and if you want to join one of our next ones. So we will have some in-person ones and an online focus group. You can contribute by signing up and the first QR code is for our next focus group. And we will also write a report on all our findings that you will be able to read via our Zenodo community. And of course, if you have any questions, you can always contact me at the email address above. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ursula. And uh, Martin is now going to give us an overview of the AI workshop. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Martin Dalhanty, uh, if we've not met before. Um, so we covered AI and scholarly communication. Our objectives and our approach were how members of us, the scholarly uh, publishing communications ecosystem, including librarians and publishers, get to grips with the opportunities and threats presented by AI, AI across content creation, dissemination, lifestyles. So we were looking at the priorities, the next steps, and we used the World Cafe format, which uh, you may be familiar with, to explore five themes. So in advance, um, our workshop facilitators uh, came up with five themes, justice, diversity, inclusion, equity from Hasib, uh, publishing workflow technology and infrastructure with Vivian, uh, Ethics, Research Integrity, Lisa, and uh, I covered legal, IP, copyright, and Gwen covered uh, developing end-user services. So the conclusions from a very active, um, busy session were the need for transparency and explainability in AI systems. And so we emphasized the importance of understanding how AI models are built, their purpose, and the data sets used. Collaboration and standardization are essential so we express the need for publishers to work together, share best practices, and develop common guidelines and standards for AI use in publishing. And education and literacy in AI are crucial. 
highlighting the importance of promoting AI literacy amongst publishers, researchers, and librarians to ensure a better understanding of AI capabilities, limitations, and ethical considerations. And finally, empirical tests and case studies are highly valuable. So conduct conducting empirical trials and sharing the results can help evaluate uh, AI tools effectiveness and guide decision making, adopting and implementing AI solutions. So what are our next steps? Well, to firstly prioritize transparency and responsible AI practices when evaluating and selecting AI tools for publishing. Uh, consider partnering with companies that provide transparent explanations of their AI models and principles behind the development. Secondly, to establish collaborative working groups or initiatives to facilitate knowledge sharing and the development of guidelines and standards for AI. Engage with learning, learned societies and organizations in different disciplines, including humanities and social sciences, to ensure diverse perspectives are represented. Thirdly, promote AI literacy and education through workshops, training programs and resources for publishers, researchers and librarians. Encourage the development of AI ethics uh, strategies and the integration of AI related topics in academic curriculum. And finally, conduct empirical trials and case studies to evaluate the effectiveness and Im impact of AI tools in publishing. Share the findings with the community to foster transparency and facilitate informed decision making. Thank you. and early career researchers and Rose and Renier who are the facilitators are going to give us an overview. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so my name is Renier. Hi everyone. Um, so I work for the company of Biologists uh, and specifically Prelights. And Prelights is a preprint highlighting service that is run by early career researchers. One of them is, is right there. <laughs> and it's uh, supported by the company of Biologists. Um, so in line with the spirit of this workshop, which is uh, publishers and ECRs together. We're also going to present this together, so I thought that would be nice. Um, so the reason why we set up this workshop in the first place is that because we've seen a lot of these ECR publisher initiatives pop up over the last couple of years, and this would be a good moment to just get a, an overview uh, and see what people are doing well, what people maybe aren't doing so well, and draw lessons from this uh, for future initiatives. Um, so we dived straight in. Ooh, sorry. Yes, we did. <laughs> we dive straight in, um, and so we basically categorize the uh, existing ECR initiatives in four categories. You might not see them anymore, but they are ECRs as, um, uh, as um, reviewers, editors, authors, and ambassadors. And so we, we then took sticky notes, and we tried to come up with as many ECR initiatives that we could think of, um, and tried to put them into, into the right category or multiple categories where, where that was necessary. Um, and so this is what we ended up with. So I thought it just looked nice. Um, and then um, from there, uh, what did I want to say? The poll? Yeah, the poll. But um, so, we, oh yeah, so we went to the sort of basic but very important questions of why would publishers actually engage with ECRs? And also very important questions, what is in it for ECRs themselves? Um, so we came up, came up with several reasons, and so we, we pulled them all together, and we did a Slido poll, which is what you see on the right. And so this is just the top five. There were several more reasons, but these are the main ones. So our group identified the main reason, or the main reason to support these initiatives as um, supporting ECR in their, uh, in their careers. Uh, but it would also help to open up the black box, which is publishing, increase the dialogue, advance the research subject, and raise ECR's profiles. Oh, okay. oh, thanks, Renia. So I'm Rose. Uh, I'm an early career researcher currently doing a editorial fellowship with the journal Age and Aging, which is published by Oxford University Press. I think several OUP colleagues are in the room today. Um, so in the next workshop, um, we then moved on um, aiming to identify some of the key challenges in setting up ECR initiatives and to generate potential solutions to these. And we started with four main topic areas and then tried to identify some of the key challenges associated with each area. We asked participants to write these down on post-it notes, which they left on the table. Um, we then swapped groups and tried to identify solutions to each other's problems. 
Um, in the interest of time, I'm just going to present one challenge and solution for each of the four main topic areas. Um, so the first was looking at what are the technical challenges involved in setting up an ECR initiative. And one of the challenges that we identified was how to reach early career researchers or be reached as an ECR. And we generated a solution of talking about open calls for applicants um, to spread um, the word as widely as possible through word of mouth, digital marketing, also thinking about new tools for global communication such as Slack. Another area is looking at how do we make sure we engage with as diverse a group of ECRs as possible. And here we highlight we really need to understand what we mean by diverse um, and representation of different groups and recognising different cultures in this. Thought that organisational change needs to come first in this and needs to be thinking about recruiting new roles, for example, uh, sensitivity specialists or specialists in EDI. Need to explore different networks and platforms and try to meet early career researchers where they currently are. So we talked about some of the financial issues surrounding ECR initiatives um, and this potential perception of exploitation of early career researchers. Talked about the need for equal treatment across the board, all the way from early career researchers right up to senior editors. Ensuring that time um, spent by ECRs is part of their working week and their job plan. They get meaningful recognition for what they do and also the need to clearly define the work that they do as part of the initiative. They're not just doing grunt work that nobody else wants to do. And finally, main, another main area we looked at was how to evaluate the impact and success of an ECR initiative. We said this is very challenging because there's no predefined framework for evaluation. So where do we get the metrics from, um, particularly as many initiatives are around soft skills development? Here we said it does depend on the objectives, um, but we need to measure engagement and we need to measure retention. We also need to come up with measures that actually can evaluate some of these soft skills, e.g. development of confidence. All right, so we liked Slido, so we use Slido <laughs> again in session three. So this time specifically focusing on the challenges. So what are the biggest challenges or what did people deem to be the biggest challenges in when setting up an ECR initiative? Again, this is just the top five, but we found the main problem to be money, uh, funding budget, uh, but then the other issues like ensuring inclusivity, um, setting the right goals, um, avoiding the perception of exploitation and ensuring commitment on both sides, both the publishers and the ECR side. Um, so after we had this poll, we quickly moved on to the most important part of, of session three, which was basically pulling everything together that we learned from session one, which was we had these different categories of ECR initiatives. And also with the inspiration, you know, being inspired by what's already out there. Um, and also by the challenges and solutions that we came up during session two, we then tried to, to come up or basically devise a step-by-step -step guide on how to set up ECR initiatives within each category. So again, review, reviewers, editors, authors, and in this case, as you see there, ambassadors. And so this is very much in line with what we aim to do with this, which is basically summarize the findings of this into a white paper, which can be helpful for both publishers and researchers in setting up and also being part of these successful future ECR initiatives. So let me then just end with that. So if you're interested in helping out with this white paper, even if you haven't attended um, this workshop, then please just talk to me and massive thanks to all the participants and thank you. And workshop D was on uh, research data, and Maria is going to um, introduce those slides. Do I need to move this? Sorry. All oh, right. Sorry, I was doing it on the screen. <laughs> digital baby. Um, good afternoon, everyone. So I'm here reporting back on um, the, the workshop on research data sharing and reuse. I start, should start by saying that this is a subject that is very keen to me as a, um, as a representative of Dryad a data publishing platform. So our general objective was really to kind of uh, gauge existing behaviors and um, test assumptions around current data practices with the goal of identifying steps that different stakeholders across the wider research ecosystem, from researchers themselves, publishers, um, funders and institutions can take to really drive forward the practice of sharing data in the open, but also reusing data, so really maximizing all the corpus of research data that is available and giving credit for, for, for that. 
So um, the, the approach that we pursued for, for the workshop uh, was really trying to get the people who produce data on a daily basis into the room. And we appreciate that this was something that the, the research at the conference has been trying to, to re encourage broadly. So really uh, focusing on the research uh, participation aspect. So you were priv privileged to have two researchers joining us, two local researchers. One who is um, a computational biologist working on drug discovery, and another who is a plant geneticist, but he's also an early career researcher and, and, and a postdoc, so he brought that perspective into the room. Uh, and we started by um, getting a sense of um, what uh, expertise and knowledge and experience people who signed up for the workshop would be bringing to the, into the discussion. So we kind of tried to gauge first uh, the level of um, understanding of, of current data practices. And we uh, kind of our um, um, conclusion at the end was that we had a mixed level of people who were quite newbies to, to these practices and some who felt relatively comfortable. Uh, and in parallel to the two researches we had, I, I think that the wider distribution was primarily people who are uh, in publishing roles and some others who are, are service providers, so people like myself in, in, in infrastructure to enable research. So across the three different workshops, uh, we focus on, on, on three key um, aspects of, of the life cycle. So we started by just understanding current behaviors to share and reuse data. So what prompts uh, researchers to share data and what would funders need, for example, to, to encourage that kind of behavior. On the second session yesterday afternoon, we focus on barriers to share data and reuse data. And today we really try to tackle on what could be solutions to overcome those barriers. Um, so, um, at the end of, of, of yesterday's workshop in the afternoon, uh, we came uh, up with uh, this um, word cloud of topics, so barriers that, that naturally arose from, from the conversations that people had at the different tables. And uh, then the facilitators went away last night and tried to organize these into three came, key themes that naturally uh, came up after we, we've gone through, through all the points. So uh, this morning we assigned each table to focus on a particular barrier and tasked them to think about what, what would be the solutions uh, that we would need to have in place and which stakeholders we would need to have engaged uh, to overcome uh, those barriers and, and put those solutions into motion. Uh, so I appreciate that, sorry, some of the text is hidden by, by the, the diagram, but the key three barriers we identified were lack of credit to share and reuse data, and fear of scooping, so um, that, that people feel that they, yeah, they may publish data in the open, but someone else may take it away and get recognition for it. The second uh, barrier was the, the need for community best practices. So I think this is a point that uh, Martin, I believe, also touched upon, that we cannot have only have a single solution that fits everyone. So we really need to be mindful of uh, different um, processes in terms of, of uptake and, and community standards and, and how to, to, to really overcome those. And lastly, something that is transversal to the wider conversation around research data uh, sharing and reuse is, is the lack of support. So what what we need to have in place to overcome that. Um, so um, so the, the group then, the, the each table went away, they focus on, on these three key subjects, they put post-its on, on a flip chart, uh, and then what we did in the end was trying to map those, uh, the solutions that the groups uh, thought about and really putting them into this matrix, uh, evaluating the, the effort against the value that those solutions could bring to really get a sense of is it something that would be quite nice to do, but is it achievable within the short term? Um, so the next steps for us would be uh, as facilitators to kind of get all this information together. Uh, ideally, we would like to have the people who attended the workshop to uh, contribute to a white paper or a blog post that we could share public to say, we appreciate that there are some limitations with the conclusions of the workshop. It was really just a small sample of everyone involved in the research data life cycle. But this is, these are the learn, learning lessons that we would like to share with you all. Um, so some of the, so I just wanted to briefly highlight some of the solutions that the groups discussed. Uh, so the group that focused on um, 
credit, uh, thought that it would be great that uh, some of the metrics that are shared currently on, on data publications could be um, fed back into the publication. So that's also part of, of the wider picture of, of, of a, a research publication. On research practices, there were a lot of emphasis on how we can leverage on learned societies to help convene uh, the dialogue so they have the benefit of those direct connections. Uh, so we for sure can, can learn a lot from them. And lastly, on the, 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 the topic of lack of support, one of the suggestions that was discussed was having gateways to enable technology integrations, but also uh, admin and, and legal and contractual uh, um, gateways that could enable greater interoperability between data repositories uh, that would enable um, researchers to share data more easily. Uh, so, um, Fiona, uh, Irachi and I are all involved in various parallel initiatives. So, for example, Dryad is part of the NIH Generalist Repository uh, Ecosystem Initiative that is aiming to standardize uh, metadata and requirements for researchers to share data. So, we'll also aim to take these outcomes to, to these parallel conversations we're involved with. So, that's me. Thank you. Last but by no means least, we have the workshop on peer review innovations, and Jason is going to present those slides. Hi everyone. Two important things to say first. First of all, thank you on behalf of the facilitation team to everybody who participated in today's session. Uh, we couldn't have done it without you, and the conversations and ideas were fantastic. And the second important thing to say is that we had by far the nicest room. <laughs> albeit with the weirdest acoustics. I think anybody who was in there for the, for the two days will testify. You could stand in one corner, whisper and hear them in, in the other corner. So in terms of having confidential conversations, it wasn't the best. Anyway, I digress. <laughs> we heard you all. Objectives and approach. Before we got into actually thinking about innovations and doing the creative fun part of this, we needed to baseline and just see where are we, test the temperature. So we started by asking the group, what's the current state of peer review? And we gave the, uh, the group four options ranging from it's all hunky-dory to it's broken beyond repair. And <laughs> it's probably not surprising in the end. We had grand ideas. Well, we'll get four even groups and then there'll be the tables and we'll, we'll get different perspectives. Everyone congregated in one corner of the room and said, yeah, it needs major improvements. It needs major overhaul, which kind of screwed up what we were planning to do in that first session. But what we did from there was on day one, we did a gap analysis in the first session. So where are the gaps? What's the current state? So we asked the, the groups, uh, we broke into tables, what are, the, what are the main threats, the main pain points, and also what works well? And I think it's fair to say that people found it easier to identify specific threats and pain points than specific things that work well. And the takeaway from the first session seemed to be, well, peer review as a concept, as an idea, has great value and is worth preserving and is worth working on. But it was harder to sort of think of specifics that are working well. Um, from there, we then asked the, uh, the groups to think about specific ideas gaps and start to think about innovations. And we got a long, long list at the end of the first day of around 30 ideas, I think, in total, which we then boiled down into a, a long list of 20. So eliminating some of the duplications. And so today we worked on uh, reducing that long list down to a top five key initiatives that we would then look at in more detail around things we can do immediately. So go home, go back to our offices from this conference and what can we do personally? What can our colleagues do? medium-term initiatives that our organisations or that we as a community can, can take forward. And then we also had a bit of fun and said, well, if, if you rule the world and money and time were no object, what are the blue sky things that we could and should be doing to improve peer review and to innovate? So we also like Slido. So <laughs> I spent most of last night compiling that long list into a poll. We categorised them, we themed them. So we had a range of options that were either institution focused, researcher focused, metadata and infrastructure, technology or culture focused. And we asked people to rank their top five and we got one of each, which was terrific. So we were focusing then in today's session around strategising and having ideas around disin disincentivising malpractice. So trying to move away from the publish or perish culture that exists at the moment. Looking at recognition for researchers, whether it's early career researchers, but also more experienced researchers in terms of their continuing professional development. On the metadata side of things, looking at PIDs, user authentication. What can we use, what can we do to actually increase, improve integrity and tracking of users? On the technology side, the thing we landed on was collaborative peer review. 
I think a lot of people in the room were inspired by the, uh, the lightning talk from Laura from IOP around the collaborative peer review taking place there, where PIs are bringing, you know, bringing, these, bringing the early career researchers in and having some transparency. So we spoke about that. And around culture, uh, you'll see in a minute, this, this is where the contentious stuff came in, prioritising quality over quantity, both in submissions and published research. So they were the top five. We also felt it was worth just sharing the bottom five. We will, by the way, put all this out after the event in terms of seeing all 20 options. The one at the bottom, I think maybe one person rated it, was uh, paid for peer review. Now, whether that's representative of a wider group or whether it was just the people in the room, I'm not sure, but it was, we thought it was insightful that that was right at, the, uh, right at the bottom. So those are our conclusions, if you like, sort of formulating that top five that we were going to focus on and prioritise today. The next steps, I'll talk more broadly about next steps in a moment, but in terms of those areas, some of these are immediate things we can do. I think most are medium term. There's, there's a bit of blue sky stuff as well in here. So on the malpractice side of things, I think straight away we can work towards greater awareness and education. Um, interestingly as well, I mean, we had a good range of people in the group. I think there is as I think there were a majority of publishers and service providers in there. We did have representation from institutions and libraries. Uh, we had Tiberius, uh, a vocal supporter of the researcher's view. Quite a lot of this seems to be pushed upstream towards the institutions and the funders. No, again, whether well, that's representative or just a function of, of our particular group, I'm not sure. So looking at consequences and penalties at an institutional level. So institutions looking to start to drive and manage this behavior. Um, on the recognition side of things, expanding existing initiatives, whether those are services such as reviewer credits, uh, ORCID peer review deposit, Koara was mentioned as well. Again, upstream, institutions actually valuing the time that researchers spend on doing peer review and recognising it as part of their overall contribution and their overall work. On the metadata and infrastructure side of things, wider adoption of ORCID. Um, Publishers obviously can, can help in that and support in that. Again, we ask the question, does it need to be mandated by funders and institutions? And do funders need to actually put their hands in their pockets and maybe help pay for this? If we had any funders and they might have a different view. And just generally standardising metadata and interoperability. Around collaborative peer review, it was really about technology. So having the technology available to support this. And maybe there's a, uh, the scope for a taxonomy there as well. Maybe expanding something like Credit Out to also cover the peer review side of things. I've saved the most contentious till last. Quality over quantity. It was the idea put forward that we should be, as a community, as globally, publishing fewer papers and publishing shorter papers. Um, now, out of this conversation came, well, how do we define quality? Is it about training? Is it about standards? Um, again, upstream, looking to train researchers. Writing good abstracts as well as writing good papers. So then you can start to look at the abstracts in terms of an initial indicator of quality of a paper. And then I'm saving the best till last. There was the idea put forward that, in a, in a, I can hear some gusts in the room already, in a pay, for public, in a pay to publish environment, is, is, there, is there merit in the idea of two or three strikes and out? And you know, so, so rather than having endless cascading where a publisher will sort of see the, see the ball bearing or the ball work the way down through the portfolio and eventually it'll land somewhere, so, you know, it can be published. Is there merit in the idea, well, you get a couple of chances to do this, and if your paper doesn't get accepted, that's it. Not sure how workable that is. I'm not sure if the technology is out there. I think certain people would have a different view on it. But we, it, I think what this reflects, it was a very broad-ranging and fascinating conversation. I think in terms of specific next steps for us as a workshop team, I think there's certainly a white paper in this. I know there are some specific things that are going to be taken forward as conversations, maybe as working groups. There's probably a whole other workshop in the quality over quantity side of things. So, okay, thanks again. Thank I'd just like to finish with a thank you. Um, first of all, thank you very much to Atipon, who sponsored, <coughs> excuse me, the workshops. I'm losing my voice. <coughs> and then, Thank you so much to all the workshop facilitators. A lot of work went into this, <coughs> and I think it was, they were very, very good sessions. <coughs> Thank you very much. <coughs>